We are home to Busch Gardens Williamsburg, voted the world's most beautiful theme park for the 28th year in a row. As a premier community in Hampton Roads, James City County strives to maintain a high quality of life for all citizens through sound fiscal management and legislative actions. In an ongoing effort to increase transparency, your Board of Supervisors holds public meetings to garner citizen input before making important decisions. Here's tonight's meeting agenda. Stay tuned, the Board of Supervisors meeting will begin shortly. I call this meeting of the Board, James City County Board of Supervisors to order. Mr. Stevens, please call the roll. Yes, sir. Mr. Hipple? Here. Mr. Hipple represents the Powhatan District and is Vice Chair to the Board. Ms. Sadler? Here. Ms. Sadler represents the Stonehouse District. Ms. Larson? Here. Ms. Larson represents the Berkeley District. Mr. McGlennon? Here. Mr. <coughs> McGlennon represents the Roberts District. Mr. Eisenhower? Here. Mr. Eisenhower represents the Jamestown District and is chair to the board. Sitting to my left is Adam Kinsman, County Attorney. I am Scott Stevens, County Administrator, and also it is my pleasure to be clerk to the board. All present. Thank you, sir. Okay, this evening, our pledge will be led by Graydon Hassan, a fifth grade student at DJ Montague. His interests include roller coaster design and swimming. <laughs> That's good. Graydon uh, participates in several clubs, including the news team, flag football, chorus, and theater. Grayson is also the SCA president at DJ Montague. And so we're going to, after a moment of silence, uh, have Grayson lead us in, in the uh, pledge, Graydon lead us in the pledge of allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. If you'll come on up. This certificate, and there is your county pin. Thank you. <laughs> Good smile. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next on our agenda are presentations, and the first one will be Social Services Department Retiree Recognition for Greg Walker. Rebecca Venroot, will you come up with me? And I'll come down with you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, here today um, to uh, honor uh, Greg Walker, who uh, started with James City County 33 years ago in general services. One of his first assignments was at the Human Services Building as the custodian, 
And once he saw the amazing work that was being done in social services at that building, he knew he could bring his skills to add to that work. So the rest was history. And he's been with us ever since. When I began working at social services, I was placed in the foster care unit, which at the time was housed in a separate building behind the courthouse. It was a small but mighty unit, and the heart of which was Greg. Right from the very beginning, I noticed a few distinct things about Greg. His warmth, his empathy, his sense of humor, his sense of fashion, and of course, <laughs> his vocal abilities. It is hard to be sad or discouraged around Greg. Each day was different as he spent most of his time in personal contact with clients young and old. He also dealt with community partners through shared support services and participation in joint events. He could take the most despondent child or family member and cheer them up just by being present and listening. Greg has never known a stranger, especially when there is a story to tell. <laughs> he has also done important work providing support and guidance to fathers wanting to improve their parenting skills and stay connected to their children. Versatile, engaging, supportive, flexible, positive, these are all words that describe Greg who exemplifies the county values of collaboration by never hesitating to assist with any and all tasks with an amazingly upbeat attitude. Who else would volunteer to spend their weekend at a conference chaperoning foster youth learning independent living skills or spend countless hours supervising visits so that foster children could spend time with their biological families or even teach a foster youth how to drive. Now that's a good story. <laughs> <laughs> His customer service skills are some of the best I have ever seen, as he consistently delivered quality services with respect, patience, and dignity, which is instrumental to the work we do at social services with our most vulnerable residents. And although Greg is no longer officially employed with James City County, his legacy will live on. And I know that he won't be a stranger. Absolutely. <laughs> have this certificate for you. Thank you, sir. And I want to run for the county. Thank you so, so much, really sir. Appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Um, first off, I just want to thank Rebecca for being an awesome director. I fell in love with, direct, with Rebecca the first day I laid eyes on her. Now, when I say fell in love, I mean in a non-sexual type way. You know what I'm saying? Because we took that training, you know, sexual abuse, you know, in a non-sexual type way. So yeah, yeah. So but yeah. Um, so um, I want to thank also, too, and thank the Board of Supervisors for having me here. I appreciate you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank um, uh, my supervisor, Amy Smith, uh, Denise, my director, assistant director. Um, and then I want to thank my lovely wife and my children for being here, whom I love so much. And, and it won't for you. If it wasn't for you, it wouldn't be no me. So I'm thanking God for them. Um, and then I want to thank my uncle for being here and my auntie. <laughs> here and I love you, auntie, for being here. Thank you for coming. Um, and, and everybody that came out, my friends and church members that came out, uh, my, my lifetime homeboy, my friend right there forever and a day. Thank him for coming. Thank everybody for having me. Grace Boone. Thank you, Grace. <laughs> Man, Grace been here at about the same time, and I love Grace. Grace, thank you for being such a friend. Um, and everybody else, I can't call everybody's name, and, but I love everybody here. And if James City County can use me in any kind of way, I am readily available. Okay? Thank you again. Thanks, everybody. Hey, thank you. Our uh, 
Our second presentation, uh, I'd like to call up a, uh, our three representatives up front here from Williamsburg, Flotilla 67, uh, U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary. We have a proclamation for Safe Boating Week. If you all would come stand right up here, please. And I'll read this proclamation. Proclamation, May 18th through 24th, uh, 2019, Safe Boating Week. Whereas during Safe Boating Week, the U.S. Coast Guard and its federal, state, and local safe boating partners encourage all boaters to explore and enjoy America's beautiful waters responsibly. And whereas safe boating begins with preparations, and whereas the Coast Guard estimates that human error accounts for 70% of all boating accidents, and that life jackets could prevent more than 80% of boating fatalities, though through, through basic boating safety procedures, we can help ensure boaters on America's coastal, inland, and offshore waters stay safe throughout the season. And whereas Safe Boating Week is, is observed to bring attention to important life-saving tips for recreational boaters so that they can have a safer, far more uh, fun experience out on the water throughout the year. Whereas the Williamsburg Flotilla 67 of the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary seeks to promote recreational boating safety in our community by providing free boating classes, safety classes, free vessel uh, safety checks, and conducting educational outreach to local schools, parks, businesses, and civic groups. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Chairman of the James, uh, Board of Supervisors of James City County, do hereby support the goals of the Safe Boating Campaign and proclaim May 18th through 24th, 2019, as Safe Boating Week in James City County. And I urge all citizens who boat to practice safe boating habits and wear a life jacket at all times. In witness hereof, I have set my hand and the seal of the county this 14th day of May, 2019. Jason, you ready? Okay, our third uh, presentation is uh, a proclamation for Adult Abuse Prevention Month, and I've got these two, and I'll read them from up here. Um, this is a proclamation for Adult Abuse Prevention Month, whereas nearly 1.8 million Virginians are currently over the age of 60, and this population is expected to increase to more than 2.3 million by 2030. And whereas during 2018, James City County Adult Protective Services received 200 327 referrals for possible adult abuse and neglect, which is a 44% increase from 2017. Of those referrals, 64% were found to be valid, and in 45% of the cases, adult abuse or neglect had occurred. And whereas older residents and residents with disabilities may be targets for abuse, which can occur in families and communities of all social, economic, racial, and ethnic backgrounds, and whereas in order to reduce the incidence of adult abuse in Virginia, there are a number of adult abuse prevention programs that provide vital services to older Virginians and Virginians with disabilities, including 24-hour hotlines, crisis intervention, emergency shelters, home-based and community services, public education, and legal advocacy. And whereas Adult Abuse Prevention Month offers all Virginians the opportunity to participate in community efforts to improve safety and well-being of people throughout the Commonwealth, to recognize organizations and individuals who serve them, and to remember victims of adult abuse and their families. And whereas the uh, Virginia Department for Aging and Rehabilitative Services, home to the Adult Protective Services Division, collaborates with James City County's Department of Social Services to help older Virginians and Virginians with disabilities live free of abuse, neglect, and exploitation. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Chairman of the Board of Supervisors of James City County, do hereby recognize May, tw May 2019 as adult Abuse Prevention Month in James City County and call this observance to the attention of all our citizens. In witness whereof, set my hand in the seal, 14th day of May 19, uh, 2019. We also have one for Foster Care Prevention Month. This one is, um, whereas for more than 100 years, the Children's Bureau has worked to assist children and youth in foster care. And whereas in 2016, Virginia extended foster care services to age 21, 
through the Fostering Futures Program. And whereas in James City County, there are 24 approved foster care families and 14 children living with foster care families. And whereas every child in foster care deserves the security and opportunity for growth that a family can provide. And whereas a child's success is best supported in a system that is family focused, child centered and community based. And whereas foster, adoptive and kinship parents provide James City County's children with opportunities to be part of caring families and help them connect to permanent homes through reunification, permanent placement with relatives, or preparation for adoption. And whereas dedicated foster families frequently adopt foster children, resulting in a greater need for more foster to adopt families. And whereas through the partnerships among foster, adoptive, and kinship parents, child welfare staff, and public and private child serving organizations, efforts are made to ensure that children are safe and their voices are heard as we work for the success of every child. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Chairman of the Board of Supervisors of James City County, do hereby recognize May 2019 as Foster Care Month in James City County and call on this, call this observance to the attention of all of our citizens to recognize and show our appreciation of our foster care families for all that they do to ensure that we have a safe place for our foster children to thrive. And witness wherever I set my hand in the seal of the county, 14th of May, 2019. We'll pass those two back to the county administrator. And we have one more presentation, and this is the Williamsburg Area Arts Commission. Uh, Ms. Susan Branch-Smith, the chair. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having us today. Um, chair Eisenhower and the Board of Supervisors, I'd like to introduce our commissioners. Some are with us today. We have four members residing in the city of Williamsburg, <clears throat> me, Vice Chair Pat Rublein, Recording Secretary Sally Wolf, who's not here, and Barbara Vollmer. We have four members from James City County, Nick Bratos, Paige Bishop, Georgiana Avioli, who is here, and Robin Phillips. Our ninth member is from York County, Charles Nuremberger. Um, Every year we come before you and give up a, a brief report of how we've spent your money. <laughs> and um, I also wanted to tell you a few other things. Each commissioner is assigned to several, um, <clears throat> excuse me, local arts organizations. We establish a relationship with each one, attend performances and events, and report back to the commission. This past year, we also offered a marketing workshop Ideas on Fire, featuring speakers from the Virginia Commission for the Arts and Old Dominion University. It was attended by 50 people. We believe that our arts community provides excellent programming, but that some of our organizations are often less skilled at filling seats. So we received good feedback for the marketing workshop and have seen results at performances. Our commissioners have also spent um, a lot of time coaching arts organizations <coughs> on our submission requirements and encouraging them to apply to the Williamsburg Area Arts Commission. We routinely provide our organizations with other arts funding options, for example, the Virginia Commission for the Arts and the Mid-Atlantic Arts Foundation. It's been a challenging year for the commission itself. <clears throat> we filled three seats this year, one city and two county, which means in addition to two new commissioners the previous year, uh, and with two of us cycling off now or very soon, we will have a very young but very dedicated commission. Um, because so many of our commissioners are, are new, we've spent a lot of time discussing uh, protocol and procedure, some of which had never been written down before. You'll be happy to know that we're now writing down more of our procedures and we're doing additional work on this <clears throat> in the near future. For the first time, we've set up online archives of our files which go back a number of years. We've spent a considerable amount of time uh, figuring out how to coordinate with the new tourism fund because tourism funding is now being provided to organizations that we're also granting to, we're trying to understand how to grant going forward. 
and occasion for the arts is a good example. Do we continue with the same levels of funding, or do we only fund some part of the occasion, for instance, having to do with local art or artists? Um, currently, we know this is a work in progress, and <clears throat> excuse me, local officials are helping us um, during the fund's pilot year. So how did granting turn out? We ended up with 30 applications, down by one from the previous year, as several organizations um, either folded or went on hiatus. The request totaled $200,825 on a par with the year before. We trimmed this by 30% to get our books to balance. So we'd like to thank the Board of Supervisors for your continued support of the arts uh, in and around Williamsburg, and I'd like to thank my fellow commissioners for their hard work and dedication. Do you have any questions for us? Any questions for um, us? Yeah. First of all, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, the work that you all do is, is very important, and, and I'm really pleased to see both that you're developing uh, an archive that will help others to, to see how the commission has functioned in the past, um, but all, and also that you're thinking about new ways of uh, participating in, in the funding of the arts with uh, the possibility of some of the tourism funding going into supporting that. Um, do you have staff support um, from uh, any of the jurisdictions? Interesting you should ask that. Yes, we have a, a liaison from the, from the city of Williamsburg, but there's been some crossover and probably the last, you know, for during the past year we've had only five months of, of our work supported by the city. So we've had to kind of jump in and do the rest. That's part of what made this year a little bit more complex for us. And where is your uh, um, website hosted? Um, ours is hosted with the City of Williamsburg under boards and commissions of the City Council. Great. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Thank you, ma'am. We really appreciate your report. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next on our agenda is public comment. And we have three speakers tonight. First is Mr. Jack Fowler. Good evening. Jack Fowler, 109 Wilderness Lane. Last month, I talked about what I perceived as problems with VDOT and our roads. And in my opinion, things have progressed and changed drastically since that time. A lot of curbs and gutters have been cleaned. A lot of the drains that were stopped have been opened. Trees that were precariously leaning over the road were cut down. And the list goes on and on. Personally, I didn't think that it could be done if they brought people from other jurisdictions in to help them get what they've done. Not to say that there's not still a lot left to be done. And in particular, 199. At the bottom, at the street level of the sound barriers, of the Jersey walls, uh, different things like that. Some of the weeds are up as high as the walls are. Um, about 60 east, it hasn't been done because they're putting the gas line in. They're off the hook. 143, part of it has been done, but not all of it. Monticello hasn't been touched. We have the courthouse businesses all the way up that road. I spoke about it last month. It hasn't been touched. And in particular, Jamestown Road in 199. Both directions for almost a half a mile. The middle all, the curb and gutter, terrible. This is a country that we, a county, that we all want to be proud of. We want businesses, we want tourists here. But small things like that make a big difference. If it was real estate, it would tell you it's curb appeal. Curb appeal is what I just talked about. Location, location, I talked about that. 
A lot of times the people will go up to look at a house and stop at the curb. They don't like what they see. They won't even go into the house to go somewhere else. So that's one of the reasons that I brought all of these things up. I'd like to commend <coughs> Mr. Larry Richardson and his crew on the Croker Road in particular. He has been over backwards trying to do the thing that I brought up that is in his district. I had the privilege to meet with him and his boss for over an hour and a half shortly after I was here. We explained both of our views. They want you to call 800 number automated to tell you what's wrong. They put you on the list and if somebody else calls and one is needs to be done worse, then they do that. I suggested if I call the 800 number, I would say the county. I explained my viewpoint of the very things that I talked about. They're short on manpower. They're short on equipment. The amount of gas tax has not gone up in years, but yet they have less people by almost 50% of what they had 20 years ago. So they're working under a handicap, but the people above them, they can't say anything to workers. The people above them, it's their obligation to speak up, get what they need to keep the job done. If they laid off almost half the people and you see that they need some back, they sure need to get them back. Last month when I spoke, I touched on our courthouse, our school, our places of worship, our cemeteries, police department, fire department, and last of all, all the citizens. They didn't leave anybody out. I find fault in every one of them that I look at. Thank goodness part of those, and they're still working on them, are starting to get done. I'm gonna cut that short, but next month I'm gonna come back and explain a little bit more about why we need to see that they get what they need so that we can keep this county looking like it should look. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Fowler. <clears throat> uh, next speaker is Peg Borman. Good afternoon. Chairman Eisenhower, members of the board, Mr. Stevens, Mr. Kinsman, Mr. Purse, Mr. Holt. I don't want to leave any of you out. Um, let's set him up here somewhere where y'all can look at him. <laughs> Maybe. Well, anyway. What about us? Um, <laughs> you don't want to sit there. Sorry about that. My name is Peg Borman, and I reside at 17 Settlers Lane in the downtown Lightfoot. And <clears throat> I come before you again this evening to talk about reducing, reusing, recycling. But first, I'm going to talk a little trash. Okay. And that's because we had April 13th was our uh, annual 41st annual spring cleanup for the county. But the weatherman didn't want to cooperate. So we only accepted the collection that day from 7 to 12. But then we had all these people saying they wanted to bring their stuff out. They'd bring it out next week or the next week. So we did... 7 to 12 on the 21st and again on the 27th and all total we had about 45 loads that came out so I was really surprised with all the rain that we had um, but they, the totals are not all yet available so you'll get that later but I want to say thanks to Mr. Hipple for coming out in the rain to encourage us and he brought his wonderful little son Ben with him um, May 4th we um, joined with the Hampton Roads group and a team up to clean up through uh, HR Green. But even with all of this, there's still a lot of trash out there on the highways and the byways because there must be a lot of folks out there that don't care like we all do about how it looks. But now to reduce. We need to reduce um, man encourage manufacturers to reduce their packaging and use more recyclable material um, and encourage the 
business community to be more earth friendly with us. And recycling is important and it's much important, too important for us to quit now. So I'm going to talk about that more next month, but we attended the um, Virginia Recycling Association convention last week and this little coachling came home with me. Uh, he's got three others in his team and he's going to help us to remember how to re uh, recycle. Uh, now, I've got other things that I was going to do, but I brought that I'd like to talk about, but my co-chair will tell you a little bit more about that. And I want to extend an invitation to uh, all of you, everyone, to come to our picnic on June the 1st. This was the postponed event from April 13th that got rained out. And so instead of having the Will Barnes um, presentation for volunteers uh, in June, we're going to have those two combined on June the 1st. And it's going to be from 4 to 8. Mark it on your calendar. It's going to be at the Will Barnes shelter, and I dare him to rain on us. <laughs> uh, it'll be at the Veterans Park on Ironbound Road. And you can call me at 565-0032 for more information or RSVP, or you can call the office at 259-5375. There's going to be activities for all ages. We're going to have music, hopefully, by Robert Hodge, our DJ from WMBG. Good food and something to please everybody, we hope. So come join us as we celebrate uh, James City County volunteers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Borman. Our third speaker is Emma Zarin Newman. Good evening, members of the board, everyone else. <laughs> um, to introduce myself to start out, Peg referenced me as her co-chair, um, and I wanted to formally introduce myself to everyone. I know I already know a couple of your faces, um, but my name is Emma Zarin Newman. I'm a third grade teacher at Matoka Elementary School, and I am newly Peg's co-chair of the Queen County Commission. So we'll be sort of together shouldering all that that is. <laughs> um, I joined the commission because of my passion for sustainability and the environment. And I've been attending meetings for almost a year now. So I'm really excited to get really involved and help push these agendas that we all care about. the reducing, reusing, recycling, um, and more sustainable practices that just benefits everyone. Um, as co-chair, one of the things that we've been talking about as a commission is looking back on what we are already doing and making sure that we're reorganizing, reevaluating to match uh, the county's goals and to make sure that we're doing everything as efficiently as possible. Um, one thing that we've recently looked at is the Good Neighbor Environment and Beautification Grant. So I encourage you to look it up. It's awesome. <laughs> Get money for cleaning up your neighborhood, making it look great, um, making great places and spaces for your community members. We just uh, worked on that a little bit. One other goal that we're really trying to focus on now is educating the public in lots of different ways. And that's sort of what I do all day, every day with my third graders, <laughs> is educating the public on you know, how to be a good citizen, how to be a steward of your community. And uh, if you want to see that in action, come to our, the Family Fun Fest. We'll be teaching kids about the new recycling uh, rules. So what can be recycled now, what shouldn't be recycled, how to separate that all out. Um, but going along with that education piece and reducing, reusing, recycling, uh, we want to make sure that we really hone in on that reducing and reusing and then recycling. They actually go in order. I tell my kids, reducing is most important, then reusing, then recycling. Because um, when you get something, when you get its packaging, for example, a shoebox, you're not just buying shoes. You're buying a rectangular prism that has a function, and it's up to you to decide its fate. Um, I snagged this from a fourth grade classroom on my way out today. <laughs> These are their book boxes. And if you are a fourth grade boy and you need to know more about women's shoe sizes, just flip it around. It's very nifty. <laughs> but this is a great example of how something as simple as mom's shoes can turn into an art project, can turn into an organizational tool for a nine-year-old to keep their books and their learning going organized. Um, and I wanted to just show it as just one example of the many ways that we can start reevaluating in our own lives and how we can tell others about creative solutions um, to tackling waste and how to reduce that waste. Uh, one <laughs> other example from my classroom that my kids were very confused about this 
by this at first, but we recently had a pizza party to get excited about the SOLs coming up. Yay! Um, and with that pizza box, I said, kids, look, there's no plates. What are we going to do? And the kids were like, Miss Newman, I forgot the plates. <laughs> what are you doing? I said, well, think about it. This is a creative solution. We have this material. We have a box, and we have pizza. What do we do to get it from, the, from my table to your desk? And they came up with a solution. Why don't we cut the pizza box apart? Turned out it was a perfect amount of pizza box for an individual plate for each student. We got out our scissors, and we made it. And the kids, I mean, it just was amazing to see their reactions too. And I know that that's the sort of reactions we can get from everyone in our community. Because if we all are thinking that way, it's better for everyone. Um, so think reduce, think reuse. I'm just reiterating what Peg says, because she's right. <laughs> Um, and if you want to see our creative solutions, we are planning on making our volunteer picnic, we're trying really hard to make it zero waste, if not just minimal waste. Um, we're going to have a composting company from Richmond is giving us a major discount to make sure that we can responsibly take care of everything. And with a lot of community help, a lot of local businesses help, we're trying to make this uh, volunteer picnic as responsible as possible. So again, start on your, I know you all wrote it down already, but just start again, just to remind yourselves, come by our picnic, see our creative solutions, and we can hopefully all work together as a community to keep that education piece going by acting what we, by, what's the word? <laughs> Talking how we walk, walking, acting. You guys know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> by all just trying to be the best that we can be and showing other people how that's done too. So thank you very much and it's nice to meet you all. Thank you. Okay, uh, we are now down to the consent calendar. And on the consent calendar this evening, uh, we have minutes adoption from last month for both our regular meeting and our work session. Uh, resolution designating May as uh, Building Safety Month. Um, a Diaskin Reservoir Park Cooperation Agreement. The Chesapeake Bay Restoration Fund Grant, which is in the amount of $2,400. Contract award for James City County Recreation Center Multipurpose Fields Irrigation System, which is $147,382. Number six is contract award public safety physicals, and that's $121,000. Number seven is contract award storm drain system repairs, and that's $143,219. And number eight is contract awards for annual HVAC support services. Does any member of the board wish to pull any item? If not, could I have a motion for the uh, motion for approval? For approval, Mr. Stevens. Ms. Larson. Aye. Mr. Hipple. Aye. Mr. McLennan. Aye. Ms. Sadler. Aye. Mr. Eisenhower. Aye. Motion carries. Okay. We are now to our public hearings, uh, and before we start, I would like to introduce uh, our um, planning commission representative, is uh, Mr. Danny Schmidt, who will be here this evening, uh, and. We will start with Z19-0002, 8231 Richmond Road rezoning. Uh, Mr. Tom Leninger will give the staff report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Mr. Forrest Harris of Bycast Inc. has applied for a rezoning for a property located at 8231 Richmond Road. The property is located approximately a quarter mile north of Tuano Business Park and Hankins Industrial Park. This proposal is to rezone approximately 2.11 acres from A1 General Agriculture to M1 Limited Business and Industrial with, the, with proffers. The parcel is designated General Industry on the 2035 Comprehensive Land Use Map and is located in the primary service area. Previously, this property received an SUP to allow for the construction of a law equipment sale and repair and retail sale of plant and garden supplies. The proposal was approved by the Board of Supervisors in 2009 this rezoning will nullify, nullify the existing SUP. The proposed use for this application is for the manufacturing and assembly of products made from previously prepared paper, plastic, metal, wood, and glass. This use is a by right use in the M1 zoning district. With the operations of this use contained within the existing 75,000 square foot building, all noise, dust, and odor effects are limited to the ex existing building. Staff visited this, the current bycast location inside the city of Williamsburg and did not see, smell, or hear any exterior impacts to the adjacent properties. Staff finds this proposal to be compatible with the existing development 
consistent with the 2035 comprehensive plan and zoning ordinance. At its April 3rd, 2019 meeting, the Planning Commission recommended approval of this rezoning and acceptance of the voluntary proffers by a vote of five to zero. Staff recommends that the Board of Supervisors approve this application subject to the proposed proffers. I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have at this time, and the applicant is here as well. Thank you. Are there any questions for staff? I have one. This is a family-owned business, you say? Yes. Okay. That's all I have right now. <laughs> any other questions? Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Schmidt, if you would come up and uh, give us the uh, recap from the Planning Commission meeting. <laughs> Good evening, Chairman Eisenhower and the rest of the board. Um, so this was, uh, back in um, April, was a brief public hearing with only a few questions from the commissioners uh, for staff and the applicant. Uh, of note, we received no concerns uh, from the neighbors via emails and or public speakers at that meeting. Staff did acknowledge that uh, one neighbor uh, of the property stopped by the planning office, but only to inquire about the light industry that would uh, be coming to the property if it were to be rezoned. Uh, let's see, during the public hearing, one of the commissioners asked the applicant, Mr. Harris, about the potential impact of tractor trailers entering the property from Richmond Road. Mr. Harris said that his business generally deals with smaller delivery vehicles, such as um, FedEx or UPS trucks. Um, later during the meeting, staff stated that under the current zoning designation of A1, tractor trailers are already permissible um, on the property. Finally, uh, towards the end of our meeting, Mr. Kropp pointed out that the Hankins Industrial Park is already more or less across from uh, said property and that the comprehensive plan calls for more aggressive zoning in this area. Um, that being said, Mr. Kropp also followed by uh, being pleased to see that the attached proffers would help to mitigate any big disruptions uh, to the potential residences that are um, adjacent to this property. And as uh, Mr. Leninger uh, just said, the uh, uh, Planning Commission supported the rezoning by a vote of 5 4 and uh, none against. Questions for Mr. Schmidt? Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Hey, I will. Open the public hearing. We have only one, uh, and this is the Mr. Harris, who is the uh, applicant, is available for comment. If the staff, uh, if uh, the board would like to hear anything from the applicant, Mr. Harris, if there are no questions from the board, or you you care to speak? I mean, it's it, uh... Chairman Eisenhower and members of the board. I appreciate the opportunity to come before you. Uh, we are a family business. We've been plugging away for 27 years, and I hope we have another 27 in front of us. We look forward to bringing a lot of good jobs to the county. Um, I, I, Tom was very thorough in his coverage. Uh, we've been working with him, and still are, to, to try to get everything through, get all the zoning approved, so this is a big hurdle, and, and I'd be happy to take any questions if, if you have. Okay. Mr. Harris, um, I want to... Thank you for going through the process, and welcome to James City County. Thank you. Yes, sir. Glad to be here. Okay. And uh, with no other public speakers, uh, I will close the public hearing and uh, look to the board for a motion. Motion to approve. We have a motion to approve. Mr. Stevens, call the roll, please. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Our uh, next one is... Uh, HW19-0001, Bush Gardens Height Limitation Waiver 2019. Roberta Suloff will give the staff presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Mr. Anthony Lubier of VHB Inc. has applied on behalf of SeaWorld Parks and Entertainment for a height limitation waiver to permit the construction of an attraction not to exceed the height of 355 feet above finish grade or 435 feet above sea level. The Bush Gardens Williamsburg site, located at 7851 Pocahontas Trail, is zoned M1 Limited Business Industrial and is designated Limited Industry on the Comprehensive Plan. A height waiver is required because the proposed structure exceeds the 60-foot height limitation imposed in the M1 zoning district. Staff finds that this proposal meets the six criteria for approval of a height waiver found in Section 24-418C of the Zoning ordinance as outlined in staff's report included in tonight's agenda. 
As an update to that report, staff worked with representatives for the applicant to determine that the highest point of the proposed structure would be over 1,100 feet from the nearest property boundary of the Bush Service Road and approximately 1,750 feet from Wherms Pond Road, the nearest interior street of the Kings Mill development. The proposed structure is located interior to the park in an area with a lower base level elevation, which staff finds could assist in mitigating visual and noise impacts in areas outside of the park. Staff have re has reviewed this application and with the proposed conditions, finds it to be consistent with the adopted comprehensive plan and the zoning ordinance and recommends that the Board of Supervisors approve this height limitation waiver subject to the conditions listed in the resolution. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have and representatives from the applicant are available tonight as well. Thank you. Okay. Excuse me, I am really sorry, but it's really difficult when people are having a conversation over here, just of where I sit, it comes right into my ear. So if you have to speak, if you wouldn't mind going to the lobby, that would be great, sorry. But it just, it, it, for whatever reason, it just goes right here. Thank you. Okay, are there uh, any questions for staff? Just wanted to, to uh, ask one thing, and that is, uh, Ms. Suloff, uh, with the um, uh, presentation that, that you prepared, the report that you prepared, uh, uh, at that point there had really not been much in terms of uh, public comment. Um, since that time, there has been some significant public Correct. comment. Correct. Right? Yeah, at the time that I prepared the report, we hadn't received any public feedback, and we received some over the weekend and in the last few days, and all of that correspondence has been forwarded to the board. Thank you. Questions for staff? Not just yet, thank you. Okay. All right, and yeah, we do not have the Planning Commission on this one, so um, we will open the public hearing. And our first speaker is uh, Mr. Ken Lemke, applicant. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kevin Lemke. I'm the president of Bush Gardens and Water Country USA. And just want to first say thank you for, uh, for your time tonight in a very critical uh, uh, piece of uh, decision going forward for our park. Bush Gardens, as you know, is a critical business to, to James City County and driving significant tax revenue, a large employer. But what is also very important to our business is continued development. And in an ever increasing competitive nature of our business, as far as uh, driving tourist dollars, uh, overnight stays and uh, other things, new attractions is, is critical to that, to that function. Part of, the, part of the planning process that you see here today is the first major step in order to realize uh, that development uh, in future years. We continue to try to be a great community partner in, in, in everything we do. We are the, the world's most beautiful theme park for, for 29 years running. And not only does that include what we do inside the park, but we also try to be a com good community partner with what you see uh, even outside the park to our neighbors along Road 60 and other places. And we want to continue that collaborative uh, approach in, in everything that we do. And that's what's critical about this decision. We know there's, there's other input, and we're happy to, to discuss that uh, here tonight. We have also taken steps, and, and my colleague Susie will, uh, will explain. Um, in any of these decisions, we look at multiple options, uh, knowing we, we, we have a long history with our, with our neighbors and always have, have done so in a way that, again, is very collaborative, and we feel that we can uh, you know, make this happen again uh, with this with this uh, development going forward. So, in order for us to continue our our track of growth, uh, again to drive tax revenue, the continued employment, and just in a critical uh, member of of this community, uh, we we ask for your support in, in moving forward, and be happy to answer any questions that you have this evening. Um, with that, I. I'll turn it over to, to my colleague Susie to provide a little more uh, detail around the situation, unless you have any questions for myself. Questions for? It's time. Right. Me. Okay. The uh, uh, next uh, applicant is uh, Susie Chile. Yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon. 
Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board for uh, having us tonight. Um, my name is Susie Cheely. I am the senior leader for design and engineering for Bush Gardens Williamsburg and Water Country USA. Um, early in 2019, we held three separate balloon tests uh, at various locations in the park. We drove outside the park to see how visible they were from several locations along Route 60, Route 143, Route 199, and most importantly, several points in Kingsmill. Um, the PowerPoint presentation that was in your packet um, represents the third and final location, which is farthest away from Kings Mill. Um, I believe that the slide that Roberta showed um, kind of indicated that it was closer than what it really is. So I know you all saw the uh, whole PowerPoint presentation, but I think that slide might have misrepresented it. It showed it a little closer to Kings Mill than it actually is. Um, we made every effort to, uh, you know, with each successive uh, balloon test, we pushed it further away to try to um, mitigate any visual impact to the neighborhood. Um, it is now closer to the center of the park proper and will have a similar visual impact that the mock tower does within Kings Mill. To further clarify, the balloon location shown on um, the PowerPoint slides that you all showed was a horizontal line, which may have um, indicated that it was, it's wider than it is. The actual structure will be very slender, more like a spire that has open lattice and uh, versus a solid construction. Um, also, part of the um, conditions of the resolution are that the county will approve the color of the uh, structure and, for example, uh, the Griffin Ride and Alpengeist were both subject to the same uh, condition, and both of those are blue. So they kind of blend in with the sky. And like I said, this is going to be a very tall, slender structure, so uh, we think that mitigates uh, the visual impact. Also in keeping with the past attractions, we had a sound study done uh, by NAVCON Engineering Network from Fullerton, California. They're an expert in this field. They utilize data from the manufacturer, its vehicle, human screams, as well as the distance away from our neighbors and the terrain and the vegetation between the two. Um, the resulting effects to our neighbors in Kings Mill will be similar to those from Mott Tower and Verbolton and should provide no appreciable increase in sound within Kings Mill. Also, as with the last several attractions, we requested KCSA, which is the um, neighborhood um, community uh, organization with Kings Mill, to allow us to meet with the Kings Mill residents as a courtesy to provide information about this height waiver request in advance of our board meeting. Um, this meeting was held on May 6th, and um, about 11 residents were in attendance. I hope we've addressed their concerns with the additional information here. Um, the cr criteria for consideration for approval of the height waiver were described in the presentation by the uh, planning department by Roberta, and we feel that we have addressed each one of these. Our park and marketing leaders have selected this world-class attraction that will bring visitors not only to our park, but also to local restaurants, hotels, and other businesses in James City County. Our business model demands that we provide new and exciting attractions to keep our park competitive and keep guests coming back for years to come. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay. Our third speaker is uh, Mr. Andrew Lloyd Williams, and he is speaking as for a group. Uh, names are listed here. Uh, good evening. Andrew Lloyd Williams, 120 Captain Graves. I'm speaking this evening as a member of the Board of Directors of Kings Mill Community Services Association, KCSA, but more particularly as a representative of Kings Mill residents that live in the Worms Pond Road area and who, as a group, would be most affected by noise from the proposed new attraction. I would first like to address some of the deficiencies in the application before you. 
At very short notice, Busch Gardens representatives Haley Sopko and Peter Switerchotsky requested an opportunity to make a presentation to Kingsmill residents about this proposed new attraction. That request referred to the application for a height waiver, but made no mention of the height requested and provided no details of the proposed attraction. We may have heard a little bit just now, but that's rather belated. Perhaps not surprisingly, with short notice and so few details, only 11 Kingsmill residents showed up for the meeting, and that was including myself. I'd like to thank John McLennan for also coming to the presentation. The Bush Gardens representatives showed various photographs from attachment three of your materials, but despite numerous questions as to the nature of the proposed structure, they provided little information beyond what could be gleaned from the photographs. Although this application for a height waiver is being made now, the nature of the proposed attraction is still not defined. So you must assume the worst. Is that blood curdling screams from a roller coaster as riders start a steep downward fall from 355 feet? Or something even worse, if that's possible, who knows? On August 8, 2017, this board approved a similar application for a height waiver to 315 feet for a project named Madrid. At that time, the application included no photographs from within Kingsmill in which the tallest point of that proposed structure would be, would be visible. The staff report included what appears to be a stock phrase. Staff finds the proposed attraction would not create dust or odor and additional noise impacts on adjacent residential properties will be minimal given the attraction's location. That staff report also included the comment, the proposed attraction is located more than 2,000 feet from the nearest property line, therefore the setbacks are well in excess of those required by the zoning ordinance. Madrid has yet to be built. A footprint shown by new documents filed with the James City County Planning Department on February 5th of this year show the ride taking up a large expanse in the Italy section of the park. The ride will require construction, erosion controls and new vegetation from the Italian village to the park's railroad tracks, then along the edge of the Rhine River. The ride will be across the Rhine from Verbolten and between the footbridge and railroad tracks that stretch across the river. That area of the park does not currently have any public attractions. Bush Gardens has still not publicly released information on what type of ride the 315-foot Madrid will be, but the new documents show it's going to be really big. Bush Gardens fans have speculated the ride could be a massive roller coaster based on the pattern of the ride's footers shown in the plans and its proposed height we can expect it to produce a lot of screams. And this is in addition to the new Finnegan's Flyer Screaming Swing Ride that just opened on May 3rd. And that word screaming is Bush Gardens description, not mine. The swing reaches a speed of 45 miles per hour. So a good source of screams from there too. Returning to the current application, the staff reports the highest point of the attraction is to be located generally in the location shown on the attached sight lines exhibit, attachment number three, approximately 2,612 feet or 0.495 miles from the nearest boundary to the Kingsmill Resort and Subdivision. I believe that is simply wrong. Compare it to the report for Madrid, which included the same statement, but with a figure, a smaller figure, 2,470 feet. And this new attraction will be much closer to Kingsmill than the location of the Madrid project by more than a thousand feet. And that really makes no sense. And perhaps use of the term Kingsmill Resort and Subdivision reveals a lack of understanding about the Kingsmill community that is much larger than the Kingsmill Resort. My calculations indicate that the tallest point of this proposed structure will be only 1,440 feet from the Wareham's Pond Recreation Center and actually 2,090 feet from my home. 
I prepared an enhanced location map from your materials along with the James City aerial map from 2017. I'd hoped to be able to display it this evening, but apparently that's, that's no longer possible. Uh, but I did email it to all the supervisors, so many of you may have seen it. I'm sorry that the audience will not be able to see it. But this map was uh, similar to the uh, current location map, but it included all of Kingsmill and had circular bands showing distances of 500 feet, 1,000 feet, 1,500, 2,000, 2,500, and 3,000 feet from the location of the tallest point of the pro proposed structure. And from that map, you could see that there are at least 20 homes that are located less than 2,000 feet from the approximate location of the tallest point of the proposed structure. And that brings me to the issue of noise. My neighbors and I are used to hearing screams, train whistles, fireworks, concerts, early morning announcements, and more from Bush Gardens. We find that statement in the staff report Staff finds the proposed attraction would not create dust or odor and additional noise impacts on adjacent residential properties will be minimal given the attraction's location. Same one as with the report from Madrid. That is, to us, unacceptably trite. We are yet to discover how much noise will be created by the proposed Madrid attraction. And this new one would certainly be much worse. It's much closer to our homes by more than 1,000 feet, and the tallest point is well above the tree lines, as you can see from the photographs in attachment three, meaning that there will be minimal mitigation of the noise impact from blood-curdling screams at the top of the 355-foot attraction. In 2014, a limited noise study of the effects of noise from Bush Gardens on the Kingsmill community was conducted by Navcon Engineering of Fullerton, California. You've just heard about them. And a copy of that report was provided to the James City County Planning Division and stamped as received on May 30th, 2014. At the very least, we feel that it would be essential for a proper study to be performed of, on the effects of this proposed new attraction on our homes in the vicinity of Wareham's Pond Road, as well as in other locations within Kingsmill. This could include repeating the balloon test at 355 feet with an attached high power speaker broadcasting the type of sounds expected from this attraction at a level at least equivalent to the loudest current sounds from other rides. And of course, all local residents should be given sufficient advance notice of the test to enable them to observe both visibly, visually and audibly. We recognize the need for Bush Gardens to innovate. The park already has other attractions for which height waivers above 60 feet have been issued, including the roller coasters Verbolton, Tempesto, Apollo's Chariot, and Griffin. And that was all before the 315-foot waiver granted for the Madrid project. Section 1520 of James City County Ordinances include the statement the Board of Supervisors hereby finds and declares that excessive noise is a serious hazard to the public health, welfare, peace and safety, and the quality of life. It is therefore the policy of the county and the purpose of this section to prevent such excessive noise. When does all this accumulation of noise-making rise reach that limit? Must we all allow Bush Gardens to seek to compete with the world's scariest rides, including King Dakar, 456 feet, Six Flags, New Jersey, Top Thrill Dragster in Sandusky, Ohio, 420 feet, Superman Escape from Krypton, Magic Mountain, California, 415 feet, Tower of Terror, Queensland, Australia, 377 feet, this would come in at number five. And in fact, Madrid will also come in at number four in the USA. So Bush Gardens is doing pretty well in competing with the scariest rides in the world. But should it continue at our expense? We would like to suggest that Bush Gardens should seek other ways to innovate, 
without building taller and taller structures and ask that the Board of Supervisors deny this request for a height waiver at least until the Madrid project is fully operational and a comprehensive study has been conducted of the possible worst effects of noise from this attraction on nearby residences in Kingsmill. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Mr. John F. Hudson. Thank you, John Hudson, 120 John Bratton. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. I'm John Hudson. I am a Kings Mill resident and currently serve as vice president of the Kings Mill Homeowners Board of Directors. And this evening, I'm sort of the official spokesperson for the Kings Mill Board of Directors. I want to uh, mostly to acknowledge the letter our Board of Directors sent to John McLennan through our legal counsel, and I think everyone has been a uh, uh, copy's gone out to everyone. Uh, requesting that the Board of Supervisors table any final decision on granting the height restriction waiver and give the 5,600 Kings Mill residents time to, to better understand the proposal. Uh, Kings Mill is the community likely most impacted by this proposal, and we feel that the time we were given to communicate this across our very large and pretty complex community really wasn't sufficient, and more time is needed for a full and fair airing of the proposal. We also want to provide time for Bush Gardens to give us uh, sufficient information so we can fully assess the impact of the project on our community. And for that reason, we ask that you table any final decision on this proposal and pick it up again at a future meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hudson. Uh, next speaker is Margaret Fowler. Good evening, my name's Margaret Fowler. I live at 406 Rivers Edge in Kings Mill, but I'm not here as a Kings Mill resident, although I endorse everything that uh, Mr. Um, Williams said. I return here because many of you may remember, I have been, I, I raised my hand seven years ago to say, yeah, I was opposed to something that was going to be really tall and ugly, and I, my life has been consumed with it for seven years. And that was a Surrey Skiffs Creek transmission project across the James River. We have just recently, and you've heard in the news, won our battle uh, while we're still in an appeals process. The U.S. Uh, uh, appeals court in the District of Columbia ruled that, in fact, the Army Corps of Engineers and Dominion Power did not do their job adequately in, in capturing all of the impacts from that project. If you read Judge Tatel's opinion, which I encourage you to do, he notes most of all the fact that they didn't, couldn't conceptualize the value of a view shed and what a view, um, damage to a view can do to a property. One of the sites that was constantly thrown in our faces <clears throat> during our plea to try to stop the towers from being built was the incursion of modernity that came from Bush Gardens and from the fact that roller coasters could be seen above the treetops as could the Mach 1 tower. So when in the six criteria that your staff has prepared, number three states such structure will not impair the enjoyment of historic attractions and areas of significant historic interest. Their comment is that given that it uh, has limited visual impact on adjacent development, it really has no impact on historic attractions. And I couldn't disagree more. We had to argue hard and fast to explain that in today's world, with a sensitivity toward uh, the uh, precious historic treasures we have here that are viewable from the James River, uh, height, projects of great height likely would not be permitted again. As we now are ready to get that case back in this local jurisdiction, and bring it back to the Army Corps of Engineers and virtually go through the same long, tedious process once again for an environmental impact statement. It will be even harder to justify that we as a county, and you all have put several hundred thousand dollars to the defense against the power lines, don't care about the visual impacts. 
the mock tower and the, and the rides are, are viewable from the river proper. They're viewable from the end of Jamestown Island. They're viewable from Black Point. So if at 300 feet mock tower is visible now, only imagine what 355 feet is going to look like. We are retaining, once again, for several hundred thousand dollars, our own um, uh, view shed experts from the Argonne National Laboratory to do an evaluation of now the newly built towers. There is precedence for that project to be torn down. So don't think that because it's built, it can't be torn down. And it will be our battle to see that it is. But I need the county to remember that for some of us, there's a corporate memory here of a long seven year battle that got us to where we are today. And so I would ask you to remember that things don't happen in vacuums and that everything you do impacts other projects at hand. And most of all is the Surrey, Surrey Skiffs Creek project. I ask you to deny this request. Thank you so much. Our next, our next speaker is um, Stephen Ralph. Hello, uh, it's Steve Ralph, uh, 104 Winster Facts. Um, I'm just going to read you this uh, uh, quote from the advisory circular 70-7460-1L from the FAA. Federal law requires that the FAA determine whether a structure that is proposed to be built or altered 200 feet above ground level or higher or near an airport does not pose a hazard to the airspace. In the uh, information I got about this hearing, I had no, there was no mention about the FAA ever being contacted to find out if this does violate airspace. Um, the next point I want to bring up is, is light pollution. Um, anything above 200 feet is going to have lights on it because it is a vertical obstruction. And those lights could be red, they could be white, they could flash, they could flash 24 hours a day and night. Which leads me to wonder, uh, I don't know what the structure is going to look like. It could look like just a, a sphere coming up straight or it could be a roller coaster that's stretched out over. Any part of that that's over 200 feet is gonna have lights on it that's gonna flash 24 hours a day. So I think until we know more about what this structure is going to look like and the people in, in Kings Mill can see what they're gonna be looking at for 24 hours a day, then it's better to know that so they can make it an informed decision. Okay, that's about it. Thank you, sir. Okay. That is our last public comment, so I will close the public hearing and look to the board for discussion. Mr. Chairman, let me uh, just, uh, if I may, ask a couple of questions. Uh, um, first of all, I think it's important for us to explain to, to everybody who may not be aware of this that height waivers are a little bit different than some of the other um, land use decisions that we have to make because of the fact that they come straight to the Board of Supervisors and don't go to the Planning Commission. So it, in a sense, truncates a bit the, um, the normal process uh, that might allow for more public input for a longer time period for consideration and so forth. So I uh, hope everybody understands that that is just the nature of, of height waiver um, uh, information. I, I do know that uh, there was some concern expressed, and, and we all received a copy of the letter from the uh, KCSA uh, asking for an opportunity for uh, more time to think about and get information about uh, this case. I would like to start that by asking a couple more questions, if I may, of, of uh, Ms. Cheely or others uh, from the Bush Gardens uh, uh, team, if I could, just to, to clarify a couple of the points we heard tonight, and not necessarily to get definitive answers, but just to, to try to um, uh, make things a little bit uh, clear. Uh, Ms. Chile, thanks for coming back up. Uh, I did have, a, first of all, a question about the um, location of the high point on the attraction listed on the map. Uh, it sounded like you indicated that it is not uh, exactly as listed, as shown on the uh, the map that we have in our packet. 
It is, it is per the location in your packet. I think the uh, location that Roberta had shown mm -hmm. showed it closer to King's Mill. So um, I just wanted to make that clarification. Okay. And so would you mind repeating again just what the, what the distances are to uh, the um, country road, I think you mentioned, and uh, to the nearest structure, the nearest residence? Right. I think it's about 1,000 feet from Country Road. Um, and, you know, per our uh, other applications with uh, the Mock Tower and Verbolton, it's uh, about the same distance from, from those. Okay. And how about the nearest residence? Um, do we have that? 1,750 feet. 1,750 feet. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, you, you referenced uh, a sound study, um, and could you tell us a little bit more about that? I think you indicated that um, the sound study uh, also included um, the um, uh, sounds of human voices on, a, on an attraction of Correct. similar nature. Correct. Um, they not only take into account the mechanics or, you know, whatever machinery or ride vehicles that would be on, on the structure, but also uh, human screams and, and the like. So all that was taken into account. Um, this is the same company that, uh, or the same uh, firm that did the sound study for, for Bolton and Mock Tower and uh, some of the other uh, projects that um, one of the other speakers referenced. So they're very, uh, very well thought of. They're experts in their field, and they're saying that the uh, the largest sound in decibels would be about 54 um, decibels, and that's the maximum that would be heard in Kings Mill. Now they used um, Harrop's Glen and one other location, which is, are the same locations that they had used on previous studies. Um, and as far as providing more detail, um, our business kind of depends on uh, keeping the attraction a secret as long as we possibly can. So um, we did give all this information to NAVCON. Um, we can't share the entire study with you at this time, but um, I assure you that it was, um, it was, it was considered. And it, the, other, the other location was the community, uh, Pierce's Court, and the other one was Harrop's Glen. So. Can, you, can you share the um, results of the study, the, the bottom line? Correct. Um, like I said, the, I can read maybe the last, the last sheet of that. Um, the maximum predicted noise levels in the Kings Mill community range from 42 decibels to 54. And um, to compare that with something that you might be familiar with, um, I know we had some. Uh, comparisons done, your HVAC unit, the compressor for your HVAC unit outside the house is between 85 and 90, so it's far less than that. Um, and part of the reason that you wouldn't hear it is because of its location um, on the downhill side of Verbolton going towards the, uh, the broken bridge at Verbolton. And the distance between that and Kings Mill, there's a lot of vegetation and terrain between the two in addition to just the distance. So um, that's how the company analyzes their, uh, their sound levels. And um, could you uh, tell us about, the, there was a height waiver the board approved a couple of years ago for the Madrid project? Correct. What, what's the status of that now? Correct. Um, the Madrid project never came to fruition. Um, we um, instead have uh, put in a, a request for a different project. Um, the tallest that that will be is 180 feet. And because the 315 foot height waiver was approved, um, we didn't have to go and re reapply for that again. So it's actually a lot less than what, what, what it would have been if the Madrid project had gone through. So we ended up not doing Madrid, but doing a different project. 
And that one is going to be under construction. We've got our building permit and our site plan approvals in place now. Um, there was a, um, an issue uh, uh, raised about whether or not the um, FAA had been contacted in, in relation to, the, to this project. Right. We have not um, received approval from the FAA yet, but we will be applying for that. Um, we did have to apply for that with Mock Tower as well. Um, so, you know, that certainly is, is one of those things that, that we have to do. Um, there are certain things that have to happen before other things happen, and, um, yeah, that would be our next step. I, I don't want to put you on the spot with this, but do you have a, an, an estimate of how many um, rides or attractions uh, currently would have to have an FAA-mandated light uh, on well, top Mott of Well, Mott Tower does at the top of it. Uh -huh. And uh, likely this one will too. Um, and could could you describe that? The uh, light. Mm -hmm. um, it's a light, and it it is blinking, I believe. Correct. White during the day and red at night. White during the day and red at night, on top of uh, Mock Tower. And otherwise, um, uh, I believe our our regulations would not permit. Um, uplighting beyond 60 feet of a, of a building? Correct, and we would have no plans to do that. Um, well, I wanted to, to raise those questions because they are um, issues that were raised by, by folks here tonight. Um, I, I'm going to uh, ask the indulgence of the board uh, to, um, uh, at, at, at the appropriate point, I don't want to cut off questions at, at all tonight, but. Uh, uh, just at the appropriate point, I would ask that uh, there be a deferral of the final decision on, on this case till our June meeting uh, with uh, an opportunity, hopefully, for uh, residents uh, to have a fuller, op a fuller chance to uh, pursue questions they might have to understand a little bit better what's being proposed and to um, allow the board to also uh, more fully understand um, the reaction of the residents and uh, the uh, impact of the uh, proposal on the uh, destination. And I, I should point out that since um, uh, Mr. Eisenhower closed the public hearing uh, on this, uh, there would be an opportunity for citizens to comment during the public comment section if, this, if the board does agree to um, defer uh, consideration to that June meeting. I've got a few questions. Um, it, it, it sounded like from listen to the comments here tonight that and I appreciate the good work that Bush Gardens does and, and all the, the um, stuff that they do for the community. Um, but it sounded like from the comments that the residents in Kings Mill didn't get a um, long enough advanced warning of, of a meeting. And, and I know y'all are pretty good about it. And that's nothing that's required. But as a good neighbor, y'all do this. And and I'm trying to meet with Kings Mill on, I've been through a couple of these now, and try to meet with them and go over what they're doing. Was there any difference of y'all's procedure this time than it has been in the past? Um, I don't think so. We, um, we were in the process of finalizing the sound study, and we wanted to have that information prior to our meeting. Um, when we contacted the uh, president of KSCA to um, schedule that meeting, uh, there were certain uh, other meetings that he already had scheduled. So the earliest that uh, we could actually accomplish that was um, May 6th, which was Monday uh, a week ago. Okay, so, so, so due to their having a, some scheduling issues, wouldn't, wouldn't they be getting maybe as early as you wanted to? Correct. And like I said, we wanted to make, before we, we, had, we had talked to Bruce Herring, is the uh, president of KCSA, we had talked to him early on and um, we wanted to make sure that we had the sound study complete by the time we talked to them so that we could uh, share with them the results. Uh, we thought it was important to uh, let them know that, uh, you know, we were looking at um, trying to uh, keep effects, the visual impact and sound impact uh, to a minimum to the neighborhood. Okay. Um, and there was out of, 2,800 residents in Kings Mill, only 11 came to the meeting? I believe that's correct, yeah. Because that's what was stated today. I, I think that counted me as well. Counted <laughs> you too. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe only 10 actual. Um, 
see there were a few more questions is there is there there were there were a few comments made um, tonight and want to give you a chance if if there was anything that was you know said during the public comment period that maybe somebody misunderstood if there's anything you wanted to add as far as some of the comments that were that were made tonight on you know anything as far as the ride I know you can't tell us about the ride and you've never been able to tell us about any ride y'all had right, right so you know it's a big cloak secret till it all unveils and you know and that's part of the part of the uh, part of our business business yeah that's yeah. That's, that's what yeah. you know we, keeps you in business and I'm and I'm you know all for you know I'd love to know what all the rides are ahead of time but you know I think some residents don't understand that and they're like you know I'd like to know what it looks like and and you know and, and know how big it's going to be and what this is going to be and what that's going to be and I know you can't tell that and that's part of the rollout as you get closer and closer to finishing this. And this is this a 2020 project. It's not something that's going to be done this summer. So yeah, the earliest a, would be 2021, actually. 2021, okay. Correct. Yeah, that would be the earliest. Um, you know, um, I do understand the confusion about the Madrid. So um, I would like to reemphasize that we aren't going to have two rides over or two attractions over 300 feet. There's just going to be this one. Um, and... You know, it is going to be pretty minimal as far as the, it's very slender, very tall and thin, and it's more of a lattice type uh, construction versus anything solid. It can be blue or silver or whatever the county decides that it can, you know, that they want it to be. Um, and it, again, we, we truly do try to be a good neighbor. We do understand our proximity to Kings Mill. Um, we were both, uh, you know, under construction back in the early 70s. Um, our park opened in 75, and, um, you know, it wasn't probably until the uh, late 80s that the neighborhood um, of Jefferson's 100 and around Wareham's Pond started getting closer to the park. Um, so we've considered, you know, we've, we've consistently expanded and, um, you know, increased our... Uh, our rides and attractions, again, just to try to keep our uh, business, keep keep people coming, keep guests coming into the area. So um, ever since then, we've really tried to involve Kings Mill, let them know as much as possible, as early as possible. And, um, you know, we like to try to continue to work collaboratively, collaboratively with them, as uh, Kevin noted. Thank you. Other questions from the board? Thank you so much for, for coming, and thanks for talking to me on the telephone last week. I appreciate that. So uh, that was, I appreciate also the history of what came first, the chicken or the egg. So it sounds like you all have been trying to work together for um, since you all came first, and then um, but the neighborhood came in closer. So I, I was curious as to how many do you receive a lot of feedback during the summer from residents? Do, does anyone ever call over about noise, lighting, that kind of thing? Um, they do. Um, Kevin could probably speak to that better than I, but um, I do know that there are comments uh, about the train whistle occasionally. Um, we used to have concerts in the fest house park area and we haven't done that for a couple years now so i think when we had concerts there 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 was some sound um issues okay. um in king's mill that people would complain about although every once in a while people would say they wished it was turned up a little louder so that they could hear it better from their back porch mm -hmm. um and let's see i know um fireworks i think is another another thing People say, you know, either either make them a little more visible to us or, you know. But I think they're only maybe like five or ten minutes, so that's not very long. And we don't have them every single night, but um, we do we do have fireworks from time to time. Thank you very much. Yeah, I do have a couple of questions. And thank you for meeting with us and explaining everything um, the past week. Um, I read in one of the emails that some sound tests, the sound tests were performed at 2 a.m. Could you confirm? Uh, no. Um, this, that's there, misinformation? Correct. That is that is that is misinformation. Okay, thank you. Um, the sound study is done with data, 
they didn't actually come out here and uh, you know put uh, sound meters on anything. They took information from the uh, manufacturer, from similar uh, similar installations that they have in other in other areas, um, and you know this company uh, takes into account the height, the distance, um, the terrain, the um, vegetation in between, and um, they uh, come up with the results. And I think they've been very close in the past um, for Mock Tower and Verbolton and some of the other ones, um, and you know. We've, we've continued to rely on them and their expertise. Okay, thank you. And you stated earlier, I just want to confirm, you're not required by law to hold community meetings? Uh, no, ma'am, but it's one of those things that we, we try to do to uh, be a good neighbor with Kings Mill. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right, thank you. Um, let me see if there's anything else. And I just want to make sure I heard all this information correct. Right. Was the original location moved further out? Correct. In order to mitigate sound? Correct. Our, our balloon and, and visual impact as well. Um, the first balloon study, we had one balloon study done, I think, as early, sometime in February. And um, we rode around and saw where it was, and then we thought, okay, let's see if we can lay this out a little differently. We moved it further away. Um, it still was somewhat visible. And so we uh, creatively, actually, among a few of the engineers, uh, found another way to get it even further away. Um, the current location is um, downhill from the Verbolton Bridge, uh, Broken Bridge area. So uh, we're able to actually take, take um, advantage of the terrain as it kind of goes down a little bit. So I believe the height isn't as high as it would, would could have been, and it's certainly further away from Kings Mill. Does that aid in the um, sound mitigation as well? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. And let me see. Um, and I know there, I had read and heard several references, and I think Mr. Hipple brought it up, about not really being able to fully visualize and know what the attraction is. But that's um, a business practice, proprietary um, Correct. measures that you have. Because Correct. Um, we, you know, we can't keep everything secret because as, as we get closer to it, there are certain um, permits that are required that require uh, location of foundations and things like that. And the closer we get to um, finishing up a project, the more information there is to share and the more information people, people have gotten very clever at being able to figure out what, what, what's going to happen. So, um, you know, but but we do try at this stage of the game. We're still a couple of years out. We do try to, uh, you know, keep our uh, cards close to the vest, if you will, um, and for competitive reasons. You know, for our businesses, such that it really, uh, it really requires that. Well, maybe our young pledge leader earlier, who wants to design roller coasters, can there come and go. work for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's everything I have for you right now. But thank you very much. Um, you, in, you indicated that the Madrid ride, which was one that was approved originally for 315 feet, uh, was not going to be built now. Correct. Since it's not going to be built, can you tell us anything about what the planned width of that was? Was that supposed to be a much larger, wider, uh, or was it also one of these very uh, short pointed uh, um, attractions? It, it was going to be taller than the one that we're putting in in 2020. Um, um, but was it? But was it going to expand over? Uh, was it going to like, for example, was it? As, there's a difference between having a, a needle up or, right. or the top of a roller coaster that's you know across. Correct. The, what, was there a wider uh, visual range that was intent, intended for that? than now that it's not going to be built. Um. Yes. Okay. That answers um, that Yes. Okay. The uh, 355 feet, you, you've moved this over a couple of times to where you've gotten it onto lower elevation land. Mm -hmm. The 355 feet is from the base of the thing to the top, so Correct. that uh, it's, it's not just absolute above sea level. It's just that's above the ground level Correct. at that point. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the last thing I, I, I was sort of curious about was because, um, you know, sound studies can be rather academic. Um, mm -hmm. Spent many years around jet engines. I know that. 
Um, have you ever done an actual sound study reading, either in the park or in any of the other um, communities around the park, uh, as opposed to uh, engineering projections of what sound might be, but an actual physical sound study of on, on a night when you have people riding a roller coaster. What does it sound like? What, what, what are the decibel levels over in the community? What are they in the park? Um, th that's something I would be very, very interested in, in, in hearing about or knowing about um, because I think that's probably much more meaningful uh, right. to us than, than, than what an engineering study might project it to be. Right. Um, it's funny you should ask because we were discussing the same thing uh, the last day or two. Um, and I don't know whether it's been done in the past, but uh, we were certainly talking about doing that, um, you know, getting a sound meter. And uh, we're closed the rest of this week until Friday. So maybe going over to the, some of these locations and getting kind of a base, a base sound. And then we're open on Friday and we're, we're open for every day after that. Um, so then maybe trying to do that as well, just by, for a I, And it would be beneficial for us also to, hear, to see what, what you uh, would find in the park itself because, you know, it's, it's like in the, in the middle of the whole thing. I can tell you that, you know, there are times, I live over in Forge Colony, it's five or six miles to the CSX tracks, but there are nights when I can hear that train. You know, it's just I live a matter in of Ford's colony. It's too. a matter. You're it's right. a matter of how sound carries. It, it really mm -hmm. is. And so, seeing you know, seeing what it actually is under actual circumstances, I think is is, is would be very important. If you all could uh, in, endeavor to do that, I think it would be helpful to see the results of that. Are there any other questions? So, Mr. Chairman, if not, I'd uh, Thank you. like. Uh, I'm sorry. I did want to ask yeah. uh, Mr. Holder a few things, if I might, please. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. We'll ask Mr. Holt to come up. Oh. Hi, thank you. Um, I, you and I were talking today, and I just wanted to make sure I understood. Can we confirm that um, Bush Gardens and Kings Mill opened probably sometime in the early 70s, um, all around the same time, give or take? Uh, yeah, I didn't write down the exact dates. I think Ms. Cheely mentioned 75. earlier um, where some parts of the park were open in advance of the sections that are closest to the park. But yeah, that development all came online roughly about the same time. But it's coming on in stages, correct? correct. So and some phases. of the ones, is it fair to say some of the ones closer to what we're talking about now were later in the developmental phase of Kings Mill? Correct. Um, and as far as you know, um, that. Of course, the county and Bush Gardens has been, has followed the process um, as far as everything we need to go through to make sure that this is following the correct protocol. Right. Okay. And then I wanted to, um, I know I'd asked you earlier, and I believe you were going to get back with me to confirm that, um, is it, is it SeaWorld the number one employer? of James City County? Um, so uh, I did was able to pull the information from the county's CAFR as of June 30th, 2018. That's the most recent one. Thank you, Sharon. Um, and it does show that um, Bush Gardens is the principal employer in the county, followed thereafter by the school system, and SeaWorld Parks is listed as the number two um, principal property taxpayer in the county. Uh, principal property taxpayer in Correct, the county. Correct, behind the number the two. Okay. All right, very good. I just wanted to confirm that information. I know we were bantering back and forth, trying to figure it out. All right, that's all I have. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, before you bring yours, can we have some discussion on so we don't? Okay. Um, <clears throat> you know, of course, um, I'm not much for deferrals and postponements and all that, um, but there's times that it's needed and, and there's times that, you know, it might be a necess necessary thing to do. I, I like to keep things as moving as quickly as possible, um, and as y'all all know. Um, but can we, can, would your motion be to the next work session? 
can we do it at the next work session instead of the next? Well, the only the only concern I have about that is we, we rescheduled the work session for next week, um, so that wouldn't really give a lot of time to, for instance, if there is going right. to be a sound yeah, study and it. so forth. Uh -huh. So I would I would be talking about the June 11th meeting. Okay, and then um, normally when we close a right, you know we 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 don't. Right. Open so, it back so, up. so we don't open the public hearing back up, but people can comment at the public comment section at the beginning of the meeting on anything that is not subject to a public hearing that night. Right. So if anybody has any comments that they would like to make about that case, even though it doesn't have a public hearing, they would be able to do it during a public comment. During a public comment. Right. Okay. Um, I just. Um, I've just got to get a few things off my chest. Um, you know, with with 2,800 people living in Kings Mill and 11 coming out to the meeting, I've, I've you know, and, and now we're changing what we're doing. I just I I find that very hard to 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 swallow. Um, but I'll you know work with the board on whatever we need to do. I know that um, Bush is a great corporate citizen, and all of us agree on that. And all the work they've done. Everything they've done as far as rides and everything for our community, they've always worked them out. Um, there was some talk tonight about vegetation, plants, and all that. There's a quota that the county makes sure that Bush Gardens keeps, and and, and it's almost a, a running joke between Bush and the county. I've got 35 more plants than the county's requiring in the ground right now. Can I use them for this project and, and go back and forth? And... Um, 29 years being the the um, beautification award for hats off. That's a and and they take care of our roads up there in front of Bush Gardens as well. So all that highway up there and all that, their their money's going in to take care of that to keep that area clean and keep it safe. They do a wonderful job in our community, and they've always been a great corporate donor for anything that the county is is asked. I know there's always concerns about. You know what's going on and what's happening and all that, but um, you know we've always seemed to to um, count on them to be fair and and put the projects in and and with talking with Miss Cheely and all that, moving the project even further away from Kings Mill is um, you know and you know most a lot of people moved here after Bush Gardens. I mean, we knew what we were moving into. It's almost me moving up into the country and going, I don't want ducks to come in my pond. I know they're up there. They're going to come in there. And, um, you know, we've got to look at it that way as well. I'm, I'm all for, you know, noise. As noise get too much and all, and I'm glad to see y'all are going to do a noise study to see what it does in Kings Mill and how it affects Kings Mill. But, um, you know, I don't want to delay this process any longer than we need to and um, so that – they can continue on what they need to do because there's a lot of work behind the scenes that, that they have to get in line before they can even order rides and, and get that stuff forward. So that's just my um, two cents on the, the matter. Yes, ma'am. Thank All you. you. No. <laughs> I, I won't take a whole lot of time except to thank everybody that came out this evening to speak about your concerns about where you live. And also, of course, thank uh, Bush Gardens for all that you do uh, for our community. I serve with Kevin on Tourism Council, and I am always excited that you're looking to invest more in, in a new attraction because that does help tourism, which in turn help, helps all of us by um, that the tax that we, the um, being the number two paying um, property tax. That, that helps keep uh, taxes low for everybody. Uh, in this particular instance, though, it, this is your district, so I will um, I will support your your motion. Um, you are going to make a motion uh, to um, come back on June 11 and um, and and give a, if that hopefully will give some extra time. I did take uh, today, and I contacted some people that I know that live in uh, Kings Mill, and one was completely unaware uh, that this was, what are you talking about, was was the text that I got back, and let me, let me see what I can do. And then another who did know um, and had felt as though she did not attend the meeting but um, had had received the information so I think it just goes on what 
people open and what they don't open. And so, um, thank you. I just uh, um, think that uh, it's important for us to recognize we are dealing with uh, one of uh, our, our most important uh, corporate citizens and a uh, great attraction that brings so many people to the community that helps support us and, and does lots of good things. We know that uh, it's, it's critically important to that uh, um, enterprise that they, can, they keep on refreshing the product that they're providing to the public. Uh, I also know we have a premier community that uh, has uh, made um, uh, a wonderful home for, for many people. And, you know, everybody's going to take their own perspective on, on this. Uh, uh, certainly before I um, suggested uh, the idea of delaying uh, this meeting, uh, th this final determination, I did uh, uh, ask whether this would be a critical uh, time in terms of the the uh, needs of, of Bush Gardens to, and and they said that, that it would not uh, uh, interfere with their timeline for getting things done. Uh, I think it is important to have an opportunity for everybody to get a, a sense of what's involved here and whether uh, uh, they uh, ultimately wind up saying yes this is fine or no uh, that they would really like uh, to, to have the proposal um, defeated. Uh, best to have full information and a good opportunity for uh, an exposure of, of uh, the, the residents to the community. I think we all understand that, that everything has changed, that Kings Mill has grown closer to Bush Gardens physically as new areas have developed. Bush Gardens has um, had to find more and more um, uh, exciting thrill rides uh, that uh, go to higher lengths and, and have, have other kinds of, of uh, uh, um, effects uh, that may not have had the same kind of uh, impact on the communities they did before. Um, and so hopefully people just by exploring a little bit more fully the, the differences can uh, reach whatever conclusion they're going to reach. We're going to have to make a decision as well. I don't think there's much in terms of compromise in, in this particular instance. You either do or you don't. Uh, but uh, we, uh, uh, I think, would benefit and I know that uh, both Kings Mill and Bush Gardens potentially can benefit quite a bit from the interaction that might take place here. So that would be uh, my motion that we uh, defer this uh, case to June 11th. But I, I did have a couple oh, of comments. Sorry. That's okay. That's all right. I just wanted to uh, remind everyone that Bush Gardens is a tremendous driver for tourism in our uh, locality. That it and economic development as well. Um, it provides successful jobs, not only for the people at Bush Gardens that they employ there, but it also draws people in to some of our um, uh, historical attractions, CW, uh, for the city and Jamestown. Um, the hotels, the motels, the restaurants, they all benefit from Bush Gardens being here, not to mention all of our teenagers are busy during the summer being kept busy and employed. Um, I think the fact, I personally feel like, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, but I won't be supporting your proposal this evening because I feel like that they are a good community um, asset for us. They do help keep our tax rates low. And um, I, I think that, you know, I, I've heard from a few people who quite frankly say, well, you know, it's, people's choice to live where they choose to live. I mean, I happen to have moved in close to some horse farms, and for me to complain about smelling pastures when the wind blows my way, which is every day is a bit unfair. So that said, I, I didn't have to, I didn't have to uh, choose to live there, um, nor ducks in my pond or anything else that might creep along way up in the country. So um, that said, and I, I appreciate you, um, uh, your motion, but uh, I feel in the best interest for one of our um, uh, number one businesses, for the number one business in our community, I would support them being able to um, move ahead with this, uh, this evening with this vote. John, um, can can that be a postponement? Because that's Robert's rules it's supposed to be. Um, we do postpone the decision. Right, to, to that date. To the, the, to, to, to the, yeah. Yeah. And um, you know, if it's if it's not an issue with Bush Gardens, and I'm not going to have an issue with us moving forward on that. So it's not a problem, not for, a problem for, for them Bush. at all to be able to, to wait. Correct. 
And I don't think we've heard from them as far as how that. Right. I, I did consult with them, uh, but if, if um, anybody cares to comment on it. We, we have a motion. Are we ready? Mr. Stevens, call a roll. Mr. Hipple? Yes. Ms. Sadler? No. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. McLennan? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Okay, that is postponed until June 11th. Do we now, need to close the public? I'm sorry. It closed. It was closed. Oh, okay. I missed that. Sorry. No, I'm ahead of you tonight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, public hearing number three is the uh, proposed fiscal 20, uh, 20 to 2025 secondary six year plan. Uh, staff presentation will be Mr. Tom Leninger. Can we give it just a, one moment? Yeah. Thank you. We'll just hold on a minute while we'll let folks depart the room. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Each year, the Virginia Department of Transportation works with James City County Board of Supervisors to develop a list of project prior priorities for the updated sec secondary six-year plan. Through the SSYP, the county receives yearly state and federal allocations to fund the proposed secondary improvements. Given the funding levels expected in the next six years, in the current projects underway, staff recommends the following priorities that mirror the Board of Supervisors' priorities for the FY19 through FY24. First prior priority proposed for the SSYP is Phase 1 of the Long Hill Road widening, currently underway from Route 199 to Old Town Road, Devon Road. Due to the existing safety concerns and capacity defici deficiencies of Long Hill Road, staff recommends keeping Phase 1 of the project as the first priority on the SSYP to ensure the, the project remains fully funded. Second priority pr proposed for the SSYP is Croker Road. This project will widen the section of roadway between Richmond Road and the James City County Library. The pr a proposed project is to change from two lanes to four lanes. Staff recommends keeping this project as second priority on the SSYP so the project remains funded. Mm -hmm. The third and fourth priorities proposed for the SSYP are the second and third phases of Long Hill Road widening, respectively. No, no funding has been allocated at this time. In addition, VDOT use, utilizes a special funding mechanism that provides annual allocations to localities for unpaved roads and bridge projects. For the unpaved road funding project, the priority project is Peach Street, which was added to the County SSYP Board of Supervisors resolution in October 2017. For the bridge funds, the priority project is Hicks Island Road Bridge. The one lane 16 foot wide bridge is fully funded. Staff recommends adoption of the attached resolution, which endorses the secondary priority list as set forth in the memo for the FY20 2025 SSYP. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have at this time. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Leninger? I don't think so. Okay. Uh, we have no planning commission on this. We, we have no questions. I will. Open the public hearing. Do we have any speakers for the? No speakers. I'll close the public hearing and look to the board for motion or discussion. Motion for approval. Motion for approval. Mr. Stevens, please call the roll. Ms. Larson. Aye. Mr. McLennan. Aye. Mr. Hipple. Aye. Ms. Sadler. Aye. Mr. Eisenhower. Aye. Motion carries. Okay. That brings us down to board considerations. Uh, <coughs> number one, an ordinance to enact a user fee for curbside recycling collection service. Ms. Grace Boone will give the staff a presentation. Good evening, Chairman Eisenhower, members of the board, Mr. Steve and Mr. Kinsman. 
At the April 9th Board of Supervisors meeting, staff recommended an ordinance to enact a user fee for curbside recycling. Curbside recycling <coughs> collection service to be adopted tonight as part of the FY20 budget. There have been two slight amendments to the recycling ordinance that, um, that we shared last month. The two changes that are um, that the fee is set at $7 a month as opposed to up to $7. And because there will be no discounts for HOAs this year, the section stating that we may offer discounts to HOAs has been removed. These changes align the ordinance more directly with the cost and services offered. Questions for Okay. Um, we'll look for the board for a motion. Motion. Mr. Stevens, call the roll. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Ms. McGlennon. If I could just take a moment to thank Grace and uh, Dawn and all the localities um, that have done so much for this. I know this was a huge undertaking. There was lots of questions, and I, uh, I'm sure there are still lots of questions to come. But, uh, <laughs> but thank you. So look forward to the education process. Okay, our second board uh, consideration is the FY 2020 budget adoption. Uh, Ms. Sharon Day will give the uh, staff presentation. Stephen Chairman, members of the board, Mr. Stevens and Mr. Kinsman. And the board's packet tonight is a resolution to appropriate funds for the fiscal year 2020 budget, which begins on July 1st, 2019 and ends on June 30th, 2020. The only changes to the resolution this year are to provide authority to the county administrator to adjust the appropriations already included in the budget for increases or decreases in federal and state funds for grants and constitutional officers should that situation arise. The authority is limited to certain dollar thresholds and we will report to the board in writing of any such actions taken to ensure proper oversight is being maintained. Also included in your packet tonight is the errata sheet which reflects the changes made to the budget as a result of the various budget meetings and work sessions held to date. The changes were limited to the general fund, and although there were changes to certain line items within the budget, the overall total budget remained the same as proposed by the county administrator. With that, that concludes my remarks, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions for Ms. Day? Uh, I don't have any questions, but I, I do want to thank Ms. Day and uh, the county administrator and the whole executive leadership team for the excellent job they did this year in putting together a budget that uh, I know must have had some challenges because there's always uh, more requests for support than we can meet, uh, and it's especially challenging in a year where we're not uh, uh, doing a the beginning of a biennium. Uh, so uh, you know, trying to, to match everything up I know must have been quite difficult, especially with the curveball we got from recycling. Um, but uh, I think the process itself worked very well. We had uh, good opportunities for feedback from citizens. Uh, we had great uh, opportunities to ask any questions we might have and appreciate very much the hard work you all put into it. I would just second that. And I, you know, I've, I've talked to people regarding uh, recycling and uh, I know there's there's been also um, some continued conversation about SB 942, though I don't quite frankly know where we would be if we did not have SB 942 money this year. Um, it is helping us tremendously take care of some things that, that we need to take care of. Uh, so um, I appreciate all the hard work that you did, and I know that you know we're not able to totally fulfill the school's budget, so I know that that's, that's going to be... Um, uh, they're going to have to make some decisions on their end. Um, but um, I, I think that it's been a good process, and I appreciate all the hard work by everybody involved. Thank you. Heather? Looking for a motion. Okay, looking for okay. a motion. Well, I've got one more thing. One more I was just checking to see if... No, go ahead. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> I will say that... <clears throat> pardon me. That pollen, my gosh, will it ever go away? Um, I was opposed to SB 942 um, a few years ago, and I, I do remain so. Um, I had hoped that we could reduce the tax rate for citizens, and after speaking with some of my colleagues, I know that there's not a consensus to do 
uh, for a reduction and to do that. Um, I would just like to reiterate that at the work session, uh, we had talked about the liaison committee, um, further discussing the issues of future think accuracies, especially for um, areas like colonial heritage, and I believe Japestown Settlement might be another example um, to a lesser degree, um, in all age-restricted communities where children um, do not reside when we're talking school budget. Um, also, the potential um, for facilities for Bright Beginnings, as Mr. McGlennon had discussed, in order to free up some of our existing elementary school classrooms. Um, I'm ha happy that we're able to um, increase and maintain our emergency services and public safety. Public safety. And as I stated, I was and still am opposed to SB 942, but we do need a budget, and therefore I will be supporting it this year. And thank you for everything that you've done for us. We appreciate your help. Is that a motion? That was a motion. There you go. Motion to approve. Oh. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Okay. <clears throat> Our third board consideration tonight is uh, C18-0118-470, uh, Lady, Lady Slipper Path Fence. Mr. Kinsman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, before you is a resolution to allow fences within a scenic easement along uh, Route 5. When the Grayland Woods neighborhood was platted, uh, there was listed on that plat a scenic easement. That scenic easement was not dedicated to any particular entity. Uh, and so therefore it falls to the county to uh, enforce it. Since the time that the neighborhood was platted, there have been a number of fences put in that easement, uh, and then actually recently a couple asked us for permission to put their fence in, and we recognize there are existing fences there. Um, the proposed fence would match the existing ones, and we were trying to come up with perhaps the easiest way uh, for the board to approve the existing fences and approve this current fence and any other fences, they may match that. So what we've done is prepared a resolution for you that uh, basically says all fences along this section of the easement are okay, provided that they meet some basic parameters, which I believe were six feet up from uh, existing grade, don't cut down any significant trees and remain in that natural unpainted wood uh, uh, look, which is what everything is out there right now. Uh, if the board approved this, this would allow the construction of a new fence out there and would basically retroactively approve all the ones that are existing. Uh, happy to answer any questions you might have. Questions for staff? Adam, is that is that land, who owns that land? So it's it, the citizens that own that property, I mean, that's their property. We just happen to have a scenic easement over it. So each lot that abuts to that owns that piece? That's correct. So the easement sort of overlays on top of the property that they already own. Okay. We're, are we looking to do away with the easement totally or just? No, sir. So this, this would allow regulate. the easement to remain. It would just say, um, so there's, it's difficult. There's no parameters given. It just says this is a scenic easement. And so what is a scenic easement? It's really, right. it's sort of up to the board. Um, we determined that constructing, putting a structure on there, a fence, would be something that the board would need to approve. Um, you know, if, if a citizen wanted to go out there in the scenic easement and remove a dead, diseased, dying tree, we'd probably say that's something you don't need to approve. We can approve that administratively. So they came in and said, we want to build something in the easement. And so this is a mechanism by which the board can say sort of one time and one time only, okay, the fences that exist out there are fine, and we're fine with anybody else in that scenic easement building another fence as long as it meets these parameters. Okay, Thanks. well, since you brought it up, what if a dead, diseased tree on the scenic, scenic easement takes out the newly constructed fence or a fence that has been constructed on there prior, whose responsibility is it then to replace the fence? That remains the homeowners. Okay. And, and if we have dead, diseased, dying trees, uh, they can come to our, usually I think it's our watershed planner, or one of the folks over there that takes a look at it, confirms that it is in fact dead and then grants them permission to take that out. Okay. You know, as, as I looked at the photographs for this particular um, request, um, it didn't seem to be much of a problem from my perspective because of the nature of the trees right along Route 5. It does raise the question, though, of what is a scenic easement for if we are fences. going to allow fences to obstruct it um, from, from the community character corridor. Um, so um, 
you know, I, I think we need to get a, a handle on other places where this is the case. And, and while I don't want to stop um, this particular individual from being able to to uh, put up the, the fence that they're seeking to put up, especially since there are already two an, on adjoining properties. And uh, it does appear that there's a, a very st strong buffer in this particular location. I think it is probably worthwhile for us to take a look at it. We had an awful lot of developments that were constructed during this time period along community character corridors. And if we meant to have scenic easements, we need to know what we meant by that. Take a look at it. Are you looking for a motion? Looking for a motion. So moved. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. McLennan? Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. And uh, board consideration number four, requesting the Commonwealth prioritize the next segment of Interstate 64 widening Lakefoot to Bottoms Bridge. Mr. Stevens and Mr. Hipple. Mr. Chair, members of the board, I think I'll start and Mr. Hipple can finish up if he needs to. As part of the 2019 General Assembly session, a bill was passed and signed by the governor creating additional funding for highway improvements. The Commonwealth has determined that the continued widening of I-64 from Hampton Roads to Richmond is a priority and this additional funding uh, puts into place the resources necessary to continue work that is already underway. The current widening project along I-64 ends at exit 234 in Lightfoot. The attached resolution therefore requests the Commonwealth Transportation Board, CTB, to commence the next phase of I-64 widening at exit 234 and proceeding incrementally westward to Bottoms Bridge. Staff recommends approval of the attached resolution which would make this request known to the CTP um, board and also recommends similar resolutions of support from Hampton Roads Transportation Accountability Commission, the Hampton Roads Transportation Planning Organization, and other Hampton Road localities be requested. And what the thought process is, they were uh, the commissioner was thinking that they may start, and it's not nothing, and nothing he said directly is going to happen. But he was thinking he would start from Bonner's Bridge and work back to James City County. What I want him to do is continue the path that we're doing out of James City County and up through New Kent. We've got approximately 8.3 miles left in James City County to finish to get us out of the county. And all our bridges and all are wide enough that it's just road and shoulder work. So it wouldn't be that expensive compared to some of the other projects that we've, you know, taken on with HR TAC. So what I'm trying to do is get our, our entire HR TAC, TPO, PDC behind this and get all our jurisdictions say, yes, we want to continue in the direction we started, even though they're going from 295 to Bonham's Bridge now with a five mile stretch, and they're getting ready to start hopefully a second stretch. But I want to get out of James City County and move up through New Kent, because if during the years going forward, if the money dries up, I don't want to drop in a bottleneck just past Lightfoot. I want to, you know, get it all the way through and get it, get it finished through James City County. So that's what that's for. I'm with him. <laughs> well, I'm with him also, but because I don't frankly know how this is going to work. Mm -hmm. um, I, it seems to me to be a traffic nightmare in the making coming. But I wondered if anybody could, because what I'm hearing, I, I was not on the board when all this, is that New Kent had an opportunity to help contribute to this and did not choose to do so, correct? Correct. They're and more, have they changed their minds at they're, all? They're looking at what they need to do now, and the I-81 money will help with this in order to enhance some of the, the funding for this to, to continue this. There, we're, we're looking at, at statewide what we can do to finish this piece of 64, and it's a no-man's land going through New Kent. I talked to New Kent uh, two, two and a half years ago and tried to get them on board with what we're doing with our TAC, and then they have a Richmond tack that they could start and get going. And their board decided at that time they didn't want to put in enact those extra taxes to, you know, get that transportation through. Now I think they've changed their mind and they're they're moving forward on some of that information now and trying to figure out what but they're, you know, a couple of years behind the eight ball. And um it's gonna take a little while to catch up. But I think they see the the importance of it and what we've been able to do with HR TAC and how much transportation because Right now, if you think about it, we have 200 single mile lanes of transportation projects as Hampton Roads going on right now. That's a lot of transportation projects. We have made huge 
amounts of transportation projects moved through the Hampton Roads area. And, um, and with, you know, just, and I'll talk about it too here shortly, is, is signing the um, Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel, you know, with the governor and, and all the commissioner and secretary of transportation, all that. And that's 3.6 billion. And that's the largest transportation project in the United States, single transportation project in the United States right now. And it's going on in Hampton Roads and James City County was a big part in helping get that there. So hats off to everyone there. And so thank you for that information. I guess um, it is, there is not much, I agree with you, but however, they do, I believe, have a Dairy Queen and a <laughs> gas station that do benefit from the people who get stuck on I-64 yep. or have to come in there. Plus, they have residents that are either traveling back to James City County to work or going to Richmond. So um, I would hope they would see the importance of helping to uh, finance this important project. I think when that bottleneck gets up in their neighborhood, they might see the importance. Maybe so. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, any further discussion? We'll motion for, for approval. approval. Motion for approval. Mr. Stevens? Ms. Larson? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Mr. McLennan? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, down to board requests and directives. All right, I'll go ahead and start. Um, let's see. We had uh, Saturday, we had the uh, fish fry up at the volunteer fire department. It went real well. Um, it rained like crazy, but we still had a load of people coming out. In fact, we sold out in the rain. And um, so that was a very well attended, a good event. Um, 800 pounds of fish went that day. So, you know, the volunteers did a great job taking care of that. Um, I'd also like to ask the county administrator, would you ask um, Rossi if he could look at possibly a light at Route 60 and Forge Road? That is a terrible intersection, especially to get out and turn left. And this week, of course, one of our officers got hit by a young man that, you know, I don't know what happened, but I'm sure it wasn't a happy day for him as well. And good thing nobody was hurt, and I'm glad everybody was safe and, and all, but um, very unfortunate for the young man that, end up you know being in an accident and much less an accident with one of our officers that probably you know didn't help at all but um you know hope all of them are doing well our officer had injured his shoulder and and um I'm, so i I'm hope hope they're doing well is, is all is as is, is best can be um i attended an event in um, forge county on may 9th with our chairman jim and i went to a very good time over in forge county with with the community there talking about you know what we're doing in james city county and how well our board works together and and what we're moving forward so um you know very good event we enjoyed ourselves very much there um may 1st i went to um the schools and um went to um <laughs> saw your picture yeah did you <laughs> farm the table got an apron and all that so i'm very happy with that <laughs> but uh, it was a good event teaching um children about uh, radishes and eating radishes and how healthy food where it comes from and and um, DJ Montague so you know hats off and it's been a while since I've been over to DJ so I was glad to make that trip back over there um, let's say I had a meeting um, most of us all had meetings with Doug on jazz the James City County Service Authority and going over stuff with um, him and where we're going and what water needs and what's coming up thank you Doug for for that and the information that you gave to us at the board um trash day the um, april 13th that was a good day even though it got rained out you know there's a lot of people came out even in the rain so and if anyone out there in the community wants to join on the clean county commission please we'll take everybody we can get the more the merrier the more fun we'll have the more people we get out there so please come join that group and and make a difference in our community um, and then on um, April 25th, uh, the governor attended our signing of myself and the commissioner, um, Britch, with um, VDOT. We both signed in place the $3.6 billion we need to do the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel. So that's on its way. And, and um, we've signed also with the um, contractors, and, and they're ready to get rolling on it. So it'll be about a year, year and a half of of preliminary stuff, getting the machine built, getting all the tests and all the environmental stuff and everything we need. But by the end of 2025, you'll have an eight lane tunnel in Hampton Roads. You'll be able to finally get across the water without as much trouble as we've had for the last 30 years. So hats off to everyone involved in that, all the communities that 
that came involved with HR TAC and and all the hard work those men and women did and our and our General Assembly members and Senate and all that, that worked very hard to to move this forward and um, VDOT Commissioner VDOT Secretary of Transportation and Governor thank you all for all your hard help so appreciate your work that does it for me thank you yes, uh, so just a couple things one I just want to thank WMBG we if anybody is interested in hearing from us for there um, any time between 5 5 30 on Wednesdays and I think that's really great that they give a spotlight I know though I have sometimes I don't get there it's not because I'm not dedicated to it but I just <laughs> get held up somewhere else and so but you don't go to any meetings or no anything. no just a reminder I'm usually probably down the street at a meeting they can <laughs> grab me uh, but uh, I w did go to the tourism kickoff and that was at Bush Gardens and it was the night before they uh, had the ribbon cutting for the new ride and a lot of people rode the new ride but we all got a bag there and I meant to bring it in and inside were all the activities that you can do here in the greater Williamsburg area which was about that big of a stack. Um, letting people know what all is going on for tourism. Uh, our new tourism director is here, and uh, so for the T Tourism Council, so we should, hopefully we can get her here to a meeting, um, Mr. Stevens. I think that would be good if, mm -hmm. if the board got an opportunity to, to hear from Vicki. Um, I was, I went to a new business. I tried to claim it for the Berkeley district. However, I found it was a Jamestown, um, but Mr. Eisenhower was nice and let me cut the ribbon and then I bought, purchased some very good cookies from a um, new business on Route 5. Um, is it Celia's Cookies? Yes, okay, they're delicious. Um, I do want to let you all know, I believe that I, that I did bring it up one other time that we were looking to do a subcommittee uh, regarding uh, advocacy work at the state level for schools funding. And yesterday, I met with um, Andrew Trivett, Barb Ramsey, Kira Cook, and um, Mr. Trivett will be uh, reaching out to Mr. Stevens uh, regarding the um, having this board officially adopt um, the fact that we would like to do a subcommittee to work on advocacy for school funding. And so um, more information as that unfolds. I hope that's something that you all will support um, as we have seen less and less coming from Richmond. And that's something that we really want to work on. Um, I want to thank you, Mr. Stevens, for these retirement uh, spotlights because that was just incredible to not everyone that we've had it, but it, after every hearing it's it's you just want to say please don't retire uh, because you're doing really great things and so that's the only downside but I really appreciate the um, the opportunity to hear what people have contributed towards the success of the county so uh, the only, and then I just had one last thing. I know that we have a couple of things moving forward about some naming, and I sent an email yesterday, and I, I was mistaken because I, I did remember, um, I was reminded, I believe, by Mr. Purse that we had named something, but I was hoping that my board colleagues might consider possibly putting together a couple of uh, Board of Supervisors member working with a couple members of staff to, you know, come up with a naming guidelines, um, even if they're not a policy, but to just to, to see what other localities are doing, see how other localities are handling that. I know I'm, I would be more comfortable with that versus you know, somebody asking me, and, and it's be, and it, it's nothing um, personal. It's just that I just would like to see a guideline how we go about, you know, if I'm approached and asked um, about naming this building and Ms. Sadler has the same idea, who, who, how do we work out 
who among us gets that naming ability. So I would just like to see some thought given towards some best practice in the um, in naming, because I do think it, it is quite a nice honor, and um, but I just find it a little confusing as it's done now. So. Bring my trusty calendar with me. <laughs> We've been busy. So I attended in Hampton the Arifa meeting with um, Robin Bledsoe, chair of the EDA, and Mr. Stevens and Chris Johnson. Um, we'll be uh, updating all of you further once we have more information on that. I also attended the Project Discovery Banquet um, this past week, honoring some of our local students. Um, it's always one of my favorite events to attend each year. Um, and speaking of the accident in front of Forge Road, I actually received a message from a citizen saying, I saw Chief Reinheimer out there in the rain helping out with that accident. So shout out to Chief for being out there and helping out with that situation. And it, uh, things like that don't go unnoticed. So everybody appreciates um, everybody pitching in and helping. Um, let's see, I did do WMBG um, since we spoke last. And I just want to say thanks to JCSA folks for coming out to my home. I have some sort of rodent who was trying to attack some of the just JCSA stuff. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll just leave it at that. So anyway, thanks for coming out and being so kind and, and visiting with us. We appreciate it. And um, I attended with um, Ms. Bledsoe and with Chris Johnson, the, um, now who's who was it that sponsored the, the uh, business, small business awards? And we had a lot of uh, great local winners, of course, Billsburg, Anvil, uh, Campground, um, my neighbor across the street with the, the drawing company um, was a runner up. He won last year. And we commented that it's amazing how you have to go all the way from Toano to Newtown to visit your neighbors across the street. <laughs> we're all so busy. So I enjoyed catching up with my neighbors at the event. And, and a shout out to all of our businesses that were honored. And we thank all of them for what they contribute to our community. So I think that's all I have for now. Chase. Uh, just a couple of, of quick things. Uh, I did have the opportunity to participate in the ribbon cutting for Finnegan's Flyer uh, and to ride the ride, uh, which... Good for um, you. <laughs> I, yeah, I tried to get... People tried to guilt me into writing. I think it's wonderful that I they opened it. I think my stomach is still up there someplace. Yeah, but, <laughs> uh, and also um, was able to attend the Teacher of the Year recognition uh, for the uh, Superintendent's Business... Uh, Superintendent's Advisory Council. Uh, and... Uh, they did a very nice uh, job of recognizing the, each of the um, uh, teachers of the year of the various schools and, to, and selecting uh, a uh, teacher of the year at the elementary, middle, and high school level, and then a teacher of the year for the, uh, for the system as a whole, and also recognizing a rookie of the year in each of the schools, which I thought was a nice uh, way of uh, drawing some attention to our uh, new recruits, if you will. Um, and uh, j there are a lot of other things going on. Um, uh, I think um, uh, I, I should point out that uh, Mr. Stevens was also on that Finnegan's Flyer um, <laughs> trip. Uh, I think maybe since our last meeting, we also went to that VACO um, <laughs> District 2 meeting, which is three hours we'll never get back again. But fascinating. Fascinating. And uh, wanted to uh, also uh, uh, just inform uh, members of the board that uh, later this week you will probably be receiving a link to a survey being conducted by the Coalition of High Growth Communities on proffers and impact fees. And that will be presented, the results of that uh, um, survey, which will be sent to the 30 fastest, 40 fastest growing communities in the state, uh, will be presented to the um, uh, Housing Commission, which is meeting this summer on uh, legislation relating to proffers and impact fees. Uh, the coalition will be having a workshop on that topic on June 14th in Spotsylvania uh, Courthouse, and uh, certainly you'll get invitations to that as well. Finally, uh, uh, last, late last week, I made a trip over to the treasurer's office and paid my taxes. Uh, and I mention that not because everybody enjoys paying taxes, 
but because it does did give me an opportunity to just think for a minute about what we get at the local level for the tax dollars that we pay. Um, I estimate I probably pay about $250 a month for both real estate and personal property taxes. And for doing that, uh, I have the opportunity to live in a community with a first-class school system, uh, with great uh, public services, with uh, great security from our public safety officers, uh, with wonderful parks and recreation facilities, and uh, with a professional staff that uh, can deal with almost any issue or problem that the citizens bring to them. So uh, while, while, again, nobody likes uh, the idea that they have to pay taxes, it is the price of a civilized community. And uh, I'm very pleased that we get such a good value out of our tax dollars. And part of that is, of course, due to the fact that we have also a very strong business community um, who help contribute to that. Jump back. Sure, go right ahead. I apologize, but when you said that about Parks and Rec, it's the Iron Man. I, I did not want to. Um, I competed in that. I, did. <laughs> I didn't want to toot my own horn by wearing my medal, <laughs> but yeah. Um, I did go out and cheer, uh, but it was, you know, I just did not know what to expect. I had been uh, involved just on the perimeter by um, hearing about it from Lisa Pacheco with the Tourism Council and um, talking with Mr. Carnifax and Mr. Stevens. And so when I went out there on Sunday, and to Craig Larson's benefit, he kept trying to tell me because he was part of water safety, and it was just an incredible event with, I think, over 2,000 participants, and, it, you know, I know that there are probably some citizens that, that may have been a little aggravated because of there was some traffic change, but it was, I, I think, overall, I think the community would agree that it was a great event. And there were people that had come out, they brought their kids, they were out there cheering uh, the participants on. And a great deal of it took place in Chickahominy Riverfront Park. And I know that took a lot of coordination by a lot of people. And so I just want to thank staff, uh, anyone that was involved with that and the a tremendous amount of volunteers and first responders that were out there. There were groups from all over that have helped before when, when it's been Rev City. But um, this was an even bigger thing and it just would not have been pulled off. And I'm anxious to hear some learning lessons because I, it's my understanding that they hope to come back next year and so, you know, we can work through those things. I actually had heard from Jody Puckett that at one point there was a study done. We've had lots of studies done. But one of the studies that we had done and talked about tourism here was that this might be a great, what our niche might be, might be triathlons because of what we have available here. And it's not a bad niche to have. Now, you know, you do have to work through some traffic and, and those type of things. But I think if the turnout was any indication, and I did a phone call with Ron Kirkland with Williamsburg Hotel Motel, and they, they did see an, up, an uptick in hotel stays. And, you know, sometimes the uptick can be in the city, but then we see... a you know, that in the, um, in the restaurants here and in the grocery stores and that kind of thing. So I thank you for letting me jump in right before you, Mr. Eisenhower, because I really wanted to make sure that I mentioned that. No problem. Okay. Thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, commend the uh, police department for the uh, May 4th Shred-a-thon. Uh, I was doing my annual or every four or five or six year clean out, and I had two grocery bags full that I, my little shredder just would not handle. And uh, so they were, they were wonderful. I went over there and just uh, took care of it very quickly. Also on the 4th, I attended the uh, Parker View, which is the um, um, run by Bay Aging for the elderly folks there in, in uh, Ironbound Village. Uh, they had their 10th anniversary, and it, it was a, uh, a, a pretty active crowd. <laughs> so uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to go over and, and uh, participate in that. And, uh, uh, we have some people who've been there all 10 years, and they really love that, uh, that, that facility. Um, 
Michael and I did do the town hall in Ford's Colony. Um, I came away with a list of about eight or nine items that uh, I need to be talking to staff about because uh, the one thing I told them was we can come give you an update on what we're doing, but what we really need to hear at these town hall meetings is what's going on in the community that you're concerned about that we may not know about. And so I think that's the value of those. I did on uh, the 10th of May to get a uh, tour of uh, Blayton School. I'm making my rounds now with the, the schools. Uh, folks and, uh, and getting the tours of the different schools. And I will leave to Mr. Stevens to talk about the preparations for our board retreat later on this month and the survey. If you would, please. Sure. <laughs> Mr. Chair, members of the board, I do have a couple things beyond the retreat, and I'll come back to that. I do want to welcome the Pure, Sick Cha the Pure Silk Championship and the LPGA event at James City County, May 20th to the 26th. Uh, we will host some of the top players in the Ladies Professional Golf Association on the renowned River Course at Kings Mill Resort. Tickets are available. The visit, visit Williamsburg are on sale, and juniors age 17 and under uh, go free with a paid adult. So, again, I would just encourage members of the community to take part in that. To have this talent this close and available really is pretty amazing and a good thing for James City County. I'd also like to mention our Jamestown Jams concert series. It's returning May 31st with the first of four concerts held at the Jamestown Beach Event Park. Gates open at 5.30. The concert begins at 6 p.m., lasts for a couple hours in that regards. The theme for May is Motown Night and features trademark. So I just encourage people to come out and enjoy free live music at our Jamestown Beach Event Park, again, May 31st at 6 o'clock p.m. And then in terms of our retreat, we are working towards that on May 31st. Uh, we will have some discussion of board interaction and just getting to know each other a little better, maybe better than sometimes we may want to know, but that's good for all of us to know more about one another. Uh, and so if we have sent you some exercises and asked that you would work through those, uh, I thought I'd give you sort of a six month of what I've seen and where I've been and make sure that I'm in the places that you as a board want me to be in terms of in the community or with our staff and other parts within the region. And then we would talk about economic development. And we will have a survey coming sort of at a high level on economic development of priorities individually and then see where the board and our EDA members maybe are together and maybe where they're apart with the idea of getting you together with the EDA board sometime in early fall to talk early or late mid-fall to talk through priorities to make sure we're heading in the right direction, both board and EDA and staff in terms of economic development. And then if there are other topics, our chairman had mentioned maybe some just looking at topics that we could discuss that maybe we would want to follow up later in life in terms of forward thinking. So if there are other things that maybe we don't discuss in detail at the retreat, but you would like us to be prepared to bring back at a future date, we'd be happy to discuss those as well. Okay. We are down to a closed session. And... Uh, I will ask for a motion to uh, enter a closed session to cons for consideration of a personal matter, the appointment of individuals to county boards and or commissions pursuant to Section 2.23711A1 of the Code of Virginia e Economic Development Authority appointments. Okay. <laughs> wow. Oh, well, you well, got three for, <laughs> three for there. Okay. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Eisen? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, we are in closed session. We're going.
Back to order. I look for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move to certify that we only spoke about those items we indicated we would speak about. Okay. Mr. Stevens. Mr. Hippel. Aye. Ms. Larson. Aye. Ms. Sadler. Aye. Mr. McGlennon. Aye. Mr. Eisenhower. Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Mr. Okay. Chairman, I move that we uh, uh, elect to the uh, Economic Development Authority uh, Mr. Jeff Scott for a term that will expire uh, in uh, August, uh, August 1st, 2019, and then for a full term following that. And uh, Mr. Vincent Campana uh, for a term that will uh, um, expire on July 31st, 2020. For the uh, yeah. And we're doing it for the full term after okay, and that, this. And, uh, right. and for the four, full four. Right. Okay. So uh, does everybody understand the motion? Yes. yes. Okay. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. We are now down to adjournment. I'll ask motion for, for adjournment okay. to 4 p.m. on May 21st, 2019 for a work session. Okay. We have a motion. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Who cares?